Um, so I'm uh, Guy Hanley. For the talk today, uh, I am going to use kind of like I have for a few of my other questions, this poll everywhere. You don't have to download the app on your phone. Um, you can just go to this website here on your phone and this is the handle that's associated with it. They're more of just to kind of jog your thoughts while we're going through it, keep you interested. Um, so the lecture was supposed to be on ID emergencies, but it, you know, obviously it basically gets down to what do you need to know when you get called in the middle of the night. Um, I, I think we've all kind of been here with, you know, you put in an order, <laughs> you go, try to go back to sleep, and the first thing you're wondering is you have everything <laughs> dotted and crossed. And um, I definitely still do that to this day when I put in orders and overthink things. So um, the ones I was going to go over are kind of central nervous system infections, so meningitis, particularly community acquired bacterial meningitis, uh, neutropenic fever. I'll do a little bit different. We'll can go through it a little quicker since it's been covered some today. Malaria, hemorrhagic fevers. And then I know in some of the other boot camp lectures, they're talking about encephalitis and sepsis. So I didn't go over those, but those are uh, potentially ID emergencies as well. So for the first question um, with this Poll Everywhere app, it's you're called overnight by the ER for antibiotic recommendations for a 44-year-old patient, no significant past medical history. His family brought him in with a headache and lethargy. He's febrile 101, tachycardic. Uh, white blood cell count is 15,000, 90% PMNs. He started on vancomycin and cepapime. They do a lumbar puncture, and they let you know that the gram stain showed gram-positive uh, diplococci. So um, they had started him on vanc and cepapime, and they're asking you, do you want to do anything else? And let me go ahead and activate it. So yeah, um, don't have to have the app. You can just go in on that website kind of on your phone. All right, so we've got a pretty uh, interesting split for things. I know not everyone can see it, not just for time's sake, I'm not gonna kind of switch back and forth, but for add ampicillin, it got 14% of the vote, add dexamethasone, 29%, uh, change cefepime to ceftriaxone, got 43%, and continue current management at 14%. So what, I guess, condition does this patient have? Or are you most worried about? Yeah, so the, the guy's got bacterial meningitis, right? You know, we have a gram stain that's positive, diplococci. What bacteria are you thinking about? Yeah, strep pneuma. So kind of the most common thing, community-acquired bacterial meningitis. Um, so the answer is actually to change cefepime to ceftriaxone, and that's because, you know, really, when we, we'll go through the community-acquired bacterial meningitis guidelines, but you, you have an organism, you know you, what it is, you're going to start targeting to that. Cepapime is providing you extra gram negative coverage. Um, so it's not really adding too much to your ceftriaxone. So you probably don't need it at that time. B is a very attractive answer, and we'll definitely go through because there is a role for dexamethasone. Why it's probably not correct in this patient is he's already been started on antibiotics before they call you. And we'll go through all the primary literature for that too. So bacterial meningitis. Um, it is a infection causing inflammation of the meninges, so the lining. Um, kind of around the brain and the central nervous system. The symptoms that you're going to hear, fever, headache, nuchal rigidity, photophobia, um, that whole kind of syndrome is what meningismus is. So whenever you say, you know, this patient has meningismus, that's the symptoms, not necessarily the diagnosis. Um, true bacterial or true meningitis, you don't have altered mental status, uh, but obviously there's a huge overlap between meningitis and encephalitis. So you kind of get this meningoencephalitis syndrome. Um, Physical exam findings, we learn about those in medical school. They're interesting. I mean, I still, for most patients, will document it and, and evaluate them, but they're not very sensitive. You, you can tell, you know, the Koenig sign is only 5% sensitive. Brzezinski's is only 30%. I will say a Koenig sign is 95% specific, though, which is pretty good. So if it's there, you really need to worry about bacterial meningitis. Um, but it's just kind of an interesting history of medicine thing. Uh, I'm just going to focus on community-acquired bacterial meningitis. So you, you only have a gram stain positive in about 5% of community-acquired bacterial meningitis. A lot of that has to do with timing of antibiotics and um, kind of how sick the patient is, what the organism is. 
um, or if you have culture or some other serologic test, something that's diagnosing it. So this is just in general throughout time, the overall mortality of bacterial meningitis by the most common community acquired organisms. So strep pneumo, Neisseria and H influenza. Um, if you can tell back in the 1910s, 1920s, basically everyone died. Uh, now the mortality for strep pneumo is still pretty high at 30%, but does anyone know why the mortality has probably dropped this much? So the advent of antibiotics. Yeah, we have something to do, right? So, <laughs> uh, you know, back in the 1910s, 1920s, they were giving people antiserum, and then we've developed more and more antibiotics that specifically target the organisms there. Uh, and as a result of that, the mortality has decreased substantially. So bacterial meningitis, the general workup, uh, when you're suspecting it, the patient has meningismus, is a lumbar puncture. If they're on aspirin, it's completely fine to do a lumbar puncture if you get called about that. The delay is about seven days if you're on Plavix. For most patients, you don't need to have any imaging. I mean, usually now we do have imaging by the time they call us, but there are a specific subset of patients who would potentially benefit from imaging before you do your lumbar puncture. What you're looking for is a space occupying lesion, something that's gonna increase cerebral pressure. So the mnemonic is fails. I, I think that's the one that's in step one and um, uh, kind of the most of the board prep books. So some sort of focal neurologic deficit. Do they have a low GCS when they come in? Altered mental status with it? Are they immunocompromised? Uh, do they have evidence of increased pressure with papilledema or something like that? Uh, a known history of a CNS lesion, malignancy, something like that? Or is it a new onset seizure in a patient who's never had a seizure before? Um, these are just some pictures you may get on board exams. So the top one is some nice gram negative diplococci for Neisseria. The bottom one is kind of these lancet shaped gram positive uh, cocci for uh, strep pneumo. Uh, you also always want to get blood cultures on these patients because especially if your antibiotics are started, your CSF can be sterilized for um, uh, Neisseria in as low as two hours and then strep pneumo as low as four hours. So, you know, anything you can do to get a diagnosis is helpful for these patients. And then the additional workup is just kind of based on their risk factors and their history. Um, that getting a CT before uh, lumbar puncture, the reasons is from a New England Journal article from 2001 um, that was actually by one of my mentors from fellowship who he, he kind of looked at what the patients who had CTs, who actually had abnormal findings, what in multivariate analysis was associated with that. So we already talked about them all. We don't have to go through them again, but um, that's kind of where all this came from. And it was actually incorporated into the IDSA guidelines. Um, this, I know, everyone has reviewed before too, kind of the differences between bacterial, viral, tuberculous, fungal uh, meningitis based on your CSF analysis, uh, opening pressures, glucose, things like that. The only thing I do want to point out is that just because it is a neutrophil predominance does not mean it's bacterial. Uh, a lot of viral, especially herpes simplex, you can have 20% uh, or 25% of them have a PMN predominance, especially early on, so right when they're presenting, and then it can develop into lymphocytic afterwards. Um, the age of the patient always should play into it because that's going to determine what you're worried about. So uh, certainly very young um, neonates and infants, you're worried about group B strep, E. coli, listeria. Uh, once you get to adulthood, it's really strep pneumo and Neisseria, the two main players. Um, over 50 or some sort of um, immunodeficiency, you might worry about uh, listeria. So I think ones that we tend to forget about or don't immediately recall is, you know, patients who are al alcohol dependency, cirrhotics, uh, poorly controlled diabetes. Um, sometimes some of our cancer patients, you know, it's it's you got to be really careful, especially if, you know, remember listeria presents a lot of times with the rhomboencephalitis. So if they are altered and have some sort of focal neurologic deficit, especially if you're getting brainstem lesions on your scan, that's when you really, really need to worry about listeria too. But it can just have a, a meningitis without any focal deficit, so you can't rely on that either. Uh, this is the general workup of bacterial meningitis, a flow chart. So uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, you, you do want to start dexamethasone before your antibiotics if you can until you've ruled out strep pneumo, and I'll go through the literature on that part. Uh, we already talked about, too, the reasons you might want to get a CT of the head just to um, you know, see if there's an intracerebral lesion, if they're a higher risk of that. 
the way you diagnose it, so positive gram stain, which our patient had uh, some sort of culture that's positive, we develop more sensitive tests to pick up things, especially because we talked about you can sterilize the CSF very quickly. So latex agglutination, antigen testing, not used very frequently anymore, but it is definitely still used in some places. Um, it's got about a 70% sensitivity. And then the newest technology is multiplex PCRs, uh, which has basically increased your sensitivity up to 100% for most of these things. Um, I, I even will usually advocate if a patient's been on antibiotics for two, three days, but they have bacterial meningitis, I know my culture is going to be worthless. But maybe my PCR, I can pick up something and I have an answer, and that can certainly help get off of antibiotics and start targeting what's um, the cause. Uh, we already talked about strep pneumo is the most common in the community. I know you all know that. Uh, Neisseria, there are several different sera groups. Sera group B is um, one that you really should associate with meningitis, um, group B strep. Others are just kind of based on risk factors. You can have hematogenous spread with staph, strep, if they uh, have endocarditis. Um, the the spirochetes are usually more of a chronic meningitis, but you can present acutely sometimes too. Uh, those are very hard to diagnose with cultures. You're usually stuck using serology or uh, urine antigen testing. Um, the empiric regimen is, uh, I know you guys all know this too, so it's IV ceftriaxone. If you're um, kind of an adult immunocompetent, you add vancomycin in case there's resistance. Uh, strep pneumo resistant to ceftriaxone. Unfortunately, that's not a huge problem here in the United States, but it is something that's still in the guidelines. Um, if you're worried about listeria, you're going to add on ampicillin. If they're uh, allergic to penicillins, Bactrim becomes your drug of choice for listeria coverage. If they're completely allergic to cephalosporins, uh, moxifloxacin is the one that's actually in the guidelines. Most of the fluoroquinolones probably work, but moxifloxacin is the one in the guidelines. There's still very little data to support that other than uh, kind of how much of the drug gets into the CSF. There's not as much kind of clinical cure data as we'd like, but um, it is something that you'll have to know, especially if you get called with, you know, severe anaphylactic penicillin allergies. Um, the dexamethasone question we kind of talked about is from a New England Journal uh, study in 2002. Uh, it was a prospective double-blind randomized control trial, 301 patients in the Netherlands. They basically gave them dexamethasone uh, 15 to 20 minutes before their first antibiotic dose. The reason they even thought to do this is there was a lot of inflammatory cytokines that were measured in bacterial meningitis. Um, the duration was four days. And if you can tell, the main outcomes to look at is unfavorable outcome, which they defined using something called the glass uh, glass no outcome score. So it's not the coma scale, it's basically a zero to five, or yeah, zero to five scale on do you get back to your pre-morbid baseline? So five is completely normal and then one through four is um, some degree of disability and then zero is death. So uh, anything that wasn't a five was considered an unfavorable outcome. And so there's a benefit of steroids. It was completely driven by strep pneumo. If you can tell here, the uh, p-value is 0 0.006 and then there's no significant difference looking at the other organisms. Um, death, Two, same thing, it was driven by strep pneumo. Um, this was kind of the basis for recommendations in the IDSA guidelines. Um, that guideline has not been updated in a long time. It's from 2004. I mean, there's not a ton that's changed, I would say, but uh, it's now archived, so it's not a, necessarily an active guideline. They did update the hospital acquired one in the last four or five years though, so. Uh, same group took that data that they had, and um, it kind of became part of their standard of care, giving patients steroids, uh, both before and after antibiotics. And then they basically two years later said, okay, let's look at all of our patients, see what we got. Um, they actually found that if you got steroids, you did worse if you took all comers. So we have this early data in a randomized control trial, which is the best type of study you can do. And we're comparing it to a retrospective study where that kind of became part of their standard of practice. What really drove the patients doing worse um, is the cohort of patients who got their steroids after the antibiotics were started. And so that's why we don't do it once the antibiotics are in, you, you kind of, you've missed your window, even if it's strep pneumo. So um, you'll see that on board questions, but also real life, you'll get calls about, you know, it's strep pneumo, they've been on antibiotics for two days. No, don't do steroids. We, you know. All right, so that's kind of bacterial meningitis. The next one is going to be um, moving into 
neutropenic fever with some other things. Activate it real quick. OK. So you're contacted overnight by the bone marrow transplant unit regarding a 55 year old patient history of uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. That's day plus 15 um, from a matched unrelated donor allogeneic stem cell transplant. Fluderabine and melphalan was a conditioning. Their uh, CMV serodiscordant donor is positive. The patient had a fever to 102. Uh, the provider's telling you the patient's completely asymptomatic other than some fatigue, but the neutrophil count is zero. They have no history of infections. They were found to be VRE colonized when they were admitted to the unit. They have one indwelling central venous catheter in the right chest, but it appears well, there's no issues. Um, the team has started cefepime two grams IV Q8 hours. What would you add to that? Or what would you recommend to the team? All right, well, Dr. Klinkova is going to be happy. Um, <laughs> and Dr. Bluch, too, I think she talked about the VRE part. Um, everybody was, uh, we got 86% saying continue current management, 14% um, saying add daptomycin. I, I would agree D is the right answer. I, I think, you know, we've got a lot of literature since the IDSA guideline was written showing that you don't need to necessarily add on empiric VRE active antimicrobials unless you have a suspicion for an infection related to it. The reason I put maybe is if you do go back to the actual IDSA guideline, it is kind of left open as an option. So it's 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 one of those that's not wrong, but we've got a lot of data showing that it probably isn't needed. So it's probably not needed. Um, I think in the future, it's it's going to be further clarified that it's not needed. Um, like we talked about, so the IDSA definition of neutropenic fever is kind of the one that's adopted pretty much across the board for uh, the including the NCCN. Uh, it's, we already mentioned all that. The higher risk patients though are, that the IDSA clarifies are a neutral count less than 100 for over seven days, a mass score of less than 21, so that I'll put it up there, but it's basically something you can go through to say, what's this risk of patients progression to overall mortality and bad outcomes. Same thing for the CISNE score. Um, it, it's pretty common. I mean, 10 to 50% of solid tumor patients are gonna have neutropenic fever. And hematologic malignancies are over 80%. So it's extraordinarily common. Um, this is the mass score that you may see. So remember, lower is worse. Uh, this was actually included in the outpatient guideline that Dr. Klinkova mentioned that if you're over 21, you can manage those patients outpatient, provided some other things are met too. You know, early follow up, uh, they live close to a hospital, they're a compliant patient, and everybody's on board with the plan. And the score actually correlates pretty well with your outcomes too. So if you see the lower score you go, your complication rate, um, you know, it's actually higher if you're low score, but part of that's driven by the fact that you're more likely to die, so you can't have a complication if you're dead already. Um, the It's a good scoring system. I'd encourage you to use it, especially in your low risk patients, just to have, if they're high risk, it's not necessarily as useful in terms of your management, but um, in terms of etiology, we already went through all of this. This is another good article from 2011 for hematologic malignancy patients. They didn't go through which side of infection all these patients were, but in terms of 747 patients with AML, neutropenic fever, so these are your high risk, 80% of them are going to have a fever at some point. It's the greatest proportion is after their first cycle of chemo too um, for those fevers, but it can happen at any time. Unknown origin was 39.4%. A bacterial cause was found in 38.4%. Uh, fungal in 13.8%. And then you kind of have this, you know, we always, I always look for this, but you know, a, a true proven drug related fever was only 4%. I suspect a lot of these unknown origins were drug related, but um, can't always prove that. So until they get their next cycle of the same drug and have a fever. Mortality. So we talked about a lower mass score, you have a higher mortality rate. Uh, gram-negative infections are usually worse than gram-positive infections, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the uh, microbiology of that and why. If you just go by organism, the highest mortality is with uh, Pseudomonas, so that's 31%, um, and that's certainly what drives our prophylactic strategies, why we use fluoroquinolones. Um, I'll tell you, you know, in the most of the studies from the 1970s, when a lot of this was looked at, prophylaxis had a substantial mortality benefit. The farther we've gotten away from that, the farther or more and more 
ESBL and multidrug resistant organisms we've had, that mortality benefit has evaporated for most situations. Um, in most of Europe and even starting to happen in a lot of the United States transplant centers, they are now dropping uh, prophylaxis because of that reason. Um, I do think that, you know, still the group that you might have a benefit and there's some every year at ID week, someone puts out a, a study looking at this is still pseudomonas bacteremia. There's probably a mortality benefit being on uh, fluoroquinolone prophylaxis, uh, but just something to consider because that's that's a thing that's changing and it's very different from even 2010 when our last guidelines were put out. So the uh, epidemiology microbiology uh, in Terabacteriaceae make up about 30 percent of those uh, organisms that cause bacteremia. Coag negative staph actually make up 24 percent. You know, a lot of these patients have lines. It's a it's a portal of entry. Uh, staph aureus is pretty low, 5 percent. Um, but in pseudomonas itself is too pretty low, 5%, but it does carry that huge mortality risk when you, when it develops. Um, the, th this is from 2014 and it's, um, from Europe. Uh, so it's European patients, a little bit different than us, probably a little bit higher rates of resistance, but just looking at their organisms, they had, uh, MRSA rates of 56%, um, methicillin resistant coag negative staph was 80%. Uh, it's probably higher even now. VRE 23%, uh, fluoroquinolone resistance is 41%. And so certainly that goes into why they don't prophylax a lot of their patients is it's very few benefit for gram negatives at that point. Uh, ESBL producing, they've got over 34%. Um, so just something to kind of, you know, keep an eye on because we're going to be the ones who have to make these kind of decisions. And it's certainly going to change during your, your practice. Um, Pseudomonas, 53% fluoroquinolone resistance. So at that point, what's your Cipro really doing? So um this is the european guideline so it was published a year after the idsa ones in 2011. very similar um in terms of risk factors for resistant bac uh, bacteria so you know if they've had a history of something resistant if you're worried about MRSA uh, you can consider adding on things um they actually when we go through empiric therapy i know dr klinkova covered the idsa one of uh piptazo cefepime carbapenem ceftazidime um, reasons to add on gram positive. The ESIL guidelines, uh, they, they kind of give you two options. They say you can kind of do what IDSA is, that you just look at the patient's risk factors, start cefepime, ceftaz, piptazo. Or if they're critically ill, they say that a de-escalation strategy up front, starting a carbapenem, if they have septic shock, known colonization, if there's a high prevalence of ESBLs in your population, and then working your way back based on um, what's kind of gone on. I don't, I would not encourage us to do that here, especially because our ESBL population is lower than that uh, in Europe, but it is something that's just to kind of consider too, especially, you know, we're all going to practice in different places. And once your ESBL rate hits a certain threshold, you're kind of stuck doing that and working backwards. So with the idea of starting big and then going down, what's the average duration of the time that you would, in theory, utilize a carbapenem before saying I'm going to narrow my like third? Me personally, or yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, so I would usually. Uh, I, I think within 48 hours, you should be able to reassess and then decide. You know, if there was an ESBL that popped up on your blood culture, then you're you're should know within 48 hours. If not, then you can kind of work back. I mean, you're obviously going to you for anything neutropenic fever. You need to do a good history, good exam. You know, these patients don't have neutrophils, so they're not going to form abscesses, and so you need to ask them, are they having? right there is worth a million dollars because people always are like oh i did a ct scan i'm like what the freak for and they're like to go for an abscess i'm like the patient is neutropenic what now on the flip side we have seen septic joints but not abscesses so be very careful about that yeah so i always ask them too like are you having pain when you're having bowel movements and things like that because you often need to do a an exam to make sure they don't have a perirectal um either too small of an abscess to pick up or just severe pain or you know you'll find sources sometimes. Once you've done all of that, I think, and I'll talk about some of those studies too, early de-escalation is becoming a much more prominent thing in infectious disease. ESIL has completely adopted it in that 2011 guideline. Um, and so if you haven't found anything at 48 hours, 72 hours, and the patient's deaf or best, you really should probably start thinking about backing off. Is it safe to back off? Now, I get it. Every patient's different, and certainly that clinical judgment goes into it too. So if there's a reason that you feel like there's something going on and that they're a high risk patient, there are reasons to kind of continue antibiotics, but 
we'll, we'll go through some of the studies because I think if it's a very simple cut and dry neutropenic fever, nothing's found, they completely defervesce that shorter is probably better. Um, this is looking at combination therapy was a study put out in Lancet Infectious Diseases in 2002. So we've got these really sick patients, you know, we're going to put them on cefepime, meropenem, piptazo. Why not add on an aminoglycoside when you get called in the middle of the night to, you know, just double cover and make sure they do better. They actually found that those patients had no additional benefit from the aminoglycoside. All they had was more adverse events. So renal injuries um, is kind of the biggest one driving that, but just you really don't need aminoglycosides. They haven't been shown to work. There are exceptions. You know, if you've got a critically ill patient, if they have a history of MDR organisms, um, you know, multipressor shock, the, you know, no one's going to fault you for giving a dose of aminoglycoside overnight while you're getting your data. Um, but for the stable patients, there's definitely no benefit. Um, so I'll kind of go into that other part I was talking about. It's a little bit off topic, I know, but it is one of the things that I'm, um, you know, pretty interested in in terms of how long, you know, we've got neutropenic fever, how long do I need to put those patients on antibiotics? When can I go back to prophylaxis? Uh, these are the three guidelines that are out there. So we've got IDSA from 2010 on the left. Uh, they basically tell you when you find an infection, you can treat whatever is clinically appropriate for that infection, you know, pneumonias, urine infections, bacteremias. Um, or they say you can just wait till their neutropenia resolves. Um, and that's kind of the traditional endpoint that for most of uh, immunocompromised ID, neutropenic fevers we've been doing. ESIL came out a little bit stronger. So this was a year after IDSA. We already talked about their, they do give you the option of starting very strong up front with carbapenems and working your way back if you have a high rate of them or if the pa patient's really sick. They basically say at 48 hours, if, uh, or I'm sorry, if they've been afebrile for 48 hours, um, they've been on antibiotics for 72 hours or longer and they're stable, you can think about going back to their prophylaxis. Um, and that's a very common strategy that I think most European centers actually employ and it, more and more uh, centers in the U.S. are doing. Uh, the European Society of Medical Oncology um, put one out in 2016. And unfortunately, it wasn't very specific on anything if you pull it up. Like it doesn't even really go through. I, I didn't put it on there for empiric regimens because they don't even really talk about empiric regimens. They kind of just say use your local resistance patterns to guide what you should do uh, without giving much guidance. So. But they did give for duration of therapy um, that, you know, if the neutropenia is resolved, obviously that you can consider stopping. If they're still neutropenic, they have no complications. They've been afebrile for five to seven days. You can stop it, except in certain high risk situations where you feel like antimicrobials are warranted for up to 10 days or until the ANC is over 0.5. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of it, it didn't really say anything other than taking the two different strategies and just saying you can do both. Um, so I'll give you the data though, unless you kind of um, think too what you're seeing. So this was a randomized control trial in Spain called the How Long Study. Uh, they had febrile neutropenia patients. No uh, etiologic diagnosis was found at 72 hours. If they found something later, they still include them in the study. It's just when they were screened at 72 hours, they couldn't have a diagnosis. Um, they basically took those ESIL-4 guidelines from 2011 and said, if you are afebrile for 72 hours, you're uh, doing well, we're going to stop antibiotics versus waiting until your neutrophils recover, which is more of the IDSA uh, traditional um, way of doing it. So a lot of stuff here. I won't go too far into the weeds, but um, obviously there were um, uh more patients who are neutropenic when they stopped antibiotics and the experimental group that was stopping antibiotics then. Um, but if you look here, there was no difference in mortality. There was actually a slight increase in adverse events. Um, and it was almost statistically significant in the experimental group. Those adverse events were mucositis, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. However, serious adverse events, which is dying, going to the ICU, um, things like that. There was actually more of those in the control group. So if you got continued on antibiotics to your neutrophils went up, um, you were more likely, and that was significant, to die, go to the ICU, that kind of thing. So this kind of is a pretty good argument for shorter is better. Uh, they followed up those patients for 28 days um, during the study. Um, overall, so, you know, they, they kind of grouped a few things together in serious adverse events to achieve that statistical significance. If you just look at mortality, there was no difference in mortality and there was a slight trend towards more mortality in the control arm. So more antibiotic or total neutropenia results. 
um, overall less antibiotic dose. So that's from Lancet Hematology in 2017. And I'll, I'll send you all this PowerPoint so you don't have to worry about all the citations. This is a great study too by Dr. Baluch and uh, Yanina here that looked at their stem cell transplant population. So as a retrospective analysis, um, basically the two groups were early de-escalation. So if a patient was stopped while they were still neutropenic, it, it's it's retrospective, so it's harder to prescribe time frames. But it's you know at any point they're stopped while they're still neutropenic compared to those who waited till the A and C resolved. Um, the uh, oh sorry. I don't have to tell you that, but there's basically no difference in outcomes in terms of uh, that earlier de-escalation versus no early de-escalation. Uh, this is one that came out actually, I think last year, uh, but it was a very similar thing. It's in Belgium. They changed their institutional protocol to that ESIL criteria in 2017. They compared it to the historical group from 2011 to 2017. Um, obviously, they're Empiric regimen is a little bit different than ours. They go meropenem, amikacin. They have much higher ESBL rates uh, than we do here. And they compared to stopping once the patient's stable, 48, 72 hours, afebrile, um, until resolution of neutropenia. And what they found, too, was um, uh, that this is just kind of the breakdown of patients. They're pretty evenly matched, um, other than the genders were uh, off between the groups, but in terms of their malignancies, treatments, they were pretty evenly matched, duration of hospitalizations, and uh, duration of neutropenia. The important thing they found, though, was there were more neutropenic fevers and more bacteremias if you de-escalate. So if I stop at 48 to 72 hours, I don't leave them on antibiotics until their neutropenia resolves, you're going to have more neutropenic fever, you're going to have more bacteremia. The trade-off is those patients live longer, though. So, you know, you, you kind of have to take it with early de-escalation because you are improving mortality. Limitations of this study, obviously, it's retrospective. So, I mean, I think the how long trial is a lot better because it's as good of data as you can get. Um, this is a comparing an institutional protocol change in 2017 to their historical group. Presumably, I mean, maybe we don't, but presumably we get better at taking care of patients as time goes on. Um, <laughs> so, just something to consider. But, I mean, I, I think it is really interesting. At it, it best, I think it's early de-escalation is not worse than waiting till neutropenia resolves. But again, the caveat is you have to do a very thorough exam, very thorough history, work things up and try to, you know, turn over every stone to find something. Um, I'll briefly mention this trial. This one is um, even more bold than I am. Um, it is called the AntibioStop trial. It was published in 2018. It was a uh, perspective observational study that they basically had two groups. So one of them was uh, like a, it was a rollout and change of their protocol. So they went with ESIL for phase one of that, where they stopped antibiotics at their febrile for 48 hours. Phase two, they stopped antibiotics at day five, even if you were still having fevers. If they couldn't find an infection, they couldn't find anything that was going on and you were still having fevers at day five, they stopped it. So if you found an infection, obviously you treat what's there, but uh, this is, I'll let y'all kind of go back and look through all this, but um, the big point to take from it, there was no difference in outcomes and mortality, ICU admission, or relapse of fever in those two patient arms. So I I'm not generally comfortable unless I'm very sure I know what is driving a fever at day five of stopping antibiotics, but you do have a decent study. It's a perspective observational study, so it's it's kind of the next best thing to a randomized control trial showing that you might be fine stopping it. So, yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. Even you have to be careful though, because, like, for example, Admiral is going to go into private practice. You might want to do something, and we've had previous fellows call us with the same problem that either your partners are not willing to endorse, or if employers are still there consulting you are not willing to endorse. So, I mean, what's great in theory, you just have to realize in practicality might not always work. I mean, Yanina and I work very hard to try to improve stewardship in the BMT sector, but everything we have to prove to them because they have a separate credentialing so called the fact certification. So even if we want something, it might not happen. So just keep that in mind. And like I said, I'm not comfortable doing that unless I am Sure, you know, they got a clot. I've looked everywhere. They're getting a drug that, you know, 40% of them get fever and it happens every single day at the same time they get that drug. But 
just to give you guys, I mean, that data is there. So I think it's something that, you know, we need to know those kind of things. Um, malaria is the next one uh, I was going to go into. Um, didn't ask any questions because it was too hard for me to come up with four different answers that made sense uh, for severe malaria. But uh, it's a, a malaria emergency. So it, there's severe malaria is very different from non-severe malaria. And it's important to kind of recognize that uh, one of them, you know, non-severe malaria is not usually an emergency, but patients who have plasmodium um, falciparum who are coming in can be extraordinarily sick. And if you are not very aggressive treating them, the mortality can approach 100%. Um, we all know it's an infection, a plasmodial, I mean, a protozoal, sorry, protozoal infection of red blood cells. The Anopheles mosquito is the one you need to know about. Classically, you know, we're taught about the four common species. For ID, you're going to have to know about uh, Nalesi, which is a emerging um, species of plasmodium that can be very severe infections as well. Uh, fortunately, it's still a pretty low incidence, but it is something that you will have on your ID board exams. Uh, is a it's fair game to be tested. Most severe cases are still falciparum. You can occasionally have a severe case with uh, Vivax. Um, like I said, Nolesi no is rare, but it also can present with very severe infections that look just like falciparum. So if you don't get any treatment you with severe malaria, the mortality is about 100%. Um, if you, you know, get on top of it and give them treatment, you can drop that all the way down to 10 to 20%. So we can make a huge difference for these patients. Um, the, I, I, I think anytime you get a question or you get a patient like this, you're going to go back to the criteria for severe malaria because there's so many of them. I did try to highlight the ones that I feel like you just kind of need to know. So if their hemoglobin is less than seven, if their creatinine is over three, if they've got over 10% parasitemia, um, or, you know, they lower that for people who are non-immune, so not necessarily living all their life in kind of endemic areas. Um, those are the ones I think the boards are going to ask the most questions about, but there are a lot of other ones, including just acidosis, hypoglycemia. Um, and so whenever you actually have a patient, I would encourage you to please just always go back to this because there are so many things it's easy to miss one as an indication for needing um, treatment for severe malaria. Uh, Workup, you want to do thick and thin smears, uh, which I know you guys know. The thing you're looking at it, ideally is this um, antigen that's uh, specific to the organism called PFHRP2. It's 95% sensitive and specific. Um, you would keep doing those smears every six to 12 hours because you want to see a drop in the parasite load. Um, there are some areas where there's a deletion of this antigen and the Amazon is, is kind of the, the main area to know about. Uh, there are also other assays. So a lot of them are uh, falciparum specific because it's the most common one. Uh, but we do, some places do have assays that are just kind of plasmodium LDH or plasmodium aldolase based to kind of say, hey, is that on the blood or in the blood? Um, obviously, the patient's very sick. They can be in shock. You want to secure an airway, get blood counts, uh, CMPs, blood gases, blood cultures. They can come in very lethargic and obtunded. So you want to rule out bacterial meningitis. That's actually in the WHO guideline too. Um, the treatment for severe malaria, you got a lot of options but there's one that's preferred. Um, you have IV, rectal, IM options. A lot of that's based on where you practice, what you're able to get quickly. In the United States, IV is kind of the standard of care unless you just can't get the drug quickly. Artesanate is the drug of choice, and I'll show you why. Um, you load them up, and then you basically continue it daily until you get that parasitemia level to drop less than 1%. Um, we don't have artemether, but that's another option. It's IM, so that's something that you know, global medicine or you're out of the country, you may see. Um, it's kind of your fallback if you don't have artesanate IV quickly available. Uh, quinine uh, is also kind of the backup option or was worldwide. We don't really have it in the United States. So you're kind of stuck using quinidine. Um, the, if you use either one of those, you have to actually combine it with doxycycline or clindamycin for kind of your initial treatment. Um, I'll go through a little bit with it. It's it's inferior to artesanate um, is one of the big things with it too. So this was uh, where that came from. It's a randomized control trial of artesanate versus quinine for severe uh, falciparum. Uh, it was published in Lancet in 2005. The in-hospital death was uh, higher if you got quinine. It's basically the thing to take away from it. 
um, and it was a pretty substantial significance. So, you know, 15 versus 22 percent. That's a good amount you can help. Uh, this is a force plot. So that, that was a randomized control trial, but then they also did a review of other studies. Um, their trial is the one that's bolded. Uh, even doing a force plot, comparing all those uh, trials as a meta-analysis, it's even more significant um, that our test is better. Um, I want, if y'all don't have this in your phone, write it down right now and just put it in your phone to have. Uh, the CDC has someone 24 hours a day for malaria. So if you ever get called, you have a patient with malaria um first obviously i'd probably call your staff and give them a heads up and say hey you know what do we need to do but the cdc number is this is the 24-hour one the 770-488-7100 uh they will walk you through everything if you don't know or remember all the guidelines they will ask you hey it's like what's the bilirubin what's the creatinine um they will help you uh, find and acquire our testinate if it's not readily available um a lot of times it's stored at like airports and things like that um i don't know at tgh if we have some on stock i'd have to ask um, some of the pharmacists i'm sure here we don't have it but um we probably don't see malaria <laughs> um but let's say you know the the you, you're waiting on our testinate um because a lot of places aren't going to have it what do you give the patient so here are your options you can give them um artemether we already talked about that's im we don't have it in the us so you're out of luck Atobiquone and proguanol, so that's uh, a lot of places will have that. You could potentially give the patient quinine, um, mefloquine. So you're, you're kind of giving them what you got that treats malaria until you get it. As soon as you get that IVR testinate, you stop whatever you're giving them and just roll back onto that IVR testinate. The main thing, and I know you guys remember this too, for our testinate is hemolytic anemia. It can be quite delayed. Um, those patients sometimes need transfusions or it can be life-threatening. So it's just something you need to let the patient and the team know, hey, even a month afterwards, just be on the lookout for this. It's something that could develop. Um, another thing to bring up too is this is from 2008 New England Journal. Like everything, you start exposing uh, organisms to a drug, they'll find a way around it. There is, um, Artemis, Ar yeah, there's resistant, I can't, Artemisinin, there you go, uh, resistant malaria. Um, that are in the world. This was from Cambodia. So even though it's our first line drug, there, there are increasing rates of resistance to it. So. Uh, and then lastly, we've got a probably a minute or two, uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers. So this is kind of in the news right now because uh, in Ghana, they had their first case of Marburg virus. Um, th these can present very nonspecifically fevers, myalgias, headaches, GI symptoms. Your biggest history is going to be kind of returning from a uh, returning traveler with a fever from an, an area that's having an outbreak or, or might have an endemic and they were out in the um, uh, a rural area or somewhere where they might have been exposed. You may get maculopapular rash, petechiae, that can progress to mucosal hemorrhages. The way that these patients die, especially for Marburg and Ebola, are they have just complete circulatory collapse from vascular endothelial damage and then that leads to multi-organ failure. Um, we are kind of an incidental host, but we're also a host that can have person to person spread through bodily fluids. So that's extremely important. Um, the main thing is if you ever suspect anything like this, if you get a call fever and returning traveler and they're very sick or, um, for whatever reason you're thinking about it, the very most important thing you can do that second is get that patient in contact and respiratory isolation, um, and, you know, alert the hospital's infection prevention or, um, to, to kind of be on the lookout for that and to get ready for that because that's what's going to help both save the um, patient's life because you can get more aggressive at kind of supporting their circulatory system looking for those things but also all the people caring for that patient and uh, trying to prevent person-to-person -person spread um, these are those viral hemorrhagic fevers to kind of know about the main two that are um, i mean it, certainly you can be very sick from dengue and you can have the same thing but uh, i think the ones that are kind of getting the most press right now is Marburg and then Ebola every once in a while um, gets uh, so those are my references um, happy to answer any questions about anything and then I'll send you guys this so you have it too